Let's begin. Uh, we are on page 84 and 85 in the Hebrew English Art Scroll Sitter. Page 84 and 85. And I'd like to discuss today the opening passage of the first bracha that is a blessing or and a meditation, which is said to introduce the reading of the Shema. So this opening line is filled with so much meaning, it's very deep, and hopefully we'll be able to take it apart. Baruch Ata we seek to draw down your presence, you. Hashem, the infinite and eternal, Elokeinu, the source of our life, Melech HaOlam, who determines the course of the world. But that's the standard introduction to any bracha. Now here's where it gets interesting. Yotzer or who forms light, uvorei choshech, and creates darkness, Ose shalom, who makes peace, uvorei es hakol, and creates all, everything. So the one who forms light creates darkness, makes peace, and creates all. Let's begin. We're on page 84 and 85 in the Hebrew English Art Scroll Sitter. And we're discussing the opening bracha, the opening blessing of uh, the prayers, meditations that introduce the reading of the Shema. Baruch Ato Hashem Elokeinu Melech HaOlam. So the classic translation is, blessed are you, God, our Lord, King of the universe. And in our study, we've learned that this means we draw you down into, into our life. You, the beyond. Yudke Vavke, the eternal and infinite. Elokeinu, that is the source of our life. Melech HaOlam, who determines the course of reality. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Yotzer or uvorei choshech, who forms light and creates darkness. Ose shalom, who makes peace, uvorei es hakol, and creates all, everything. This, the opening part of the blessing, is a standard opening of any bracha. The, uh, the words Yotzer or Uvore Choshech, etc., are almost an exact quote from the prophet Yeshayahu, Isaiah chapter 45, verse 5, I believe. Yeah. 45, verse 7. Okay. So let's see if you have the same question as me. What's the question? The question is, in Voracious, in the very beginning, it says, okay, let's try to address it. Mm. Part, the earth, the soul, the soul, the horse, how to make the homes. The horse was there. How can you create the horse? What is the creation of darkness? Darkness is the absence of light. Right. What is this creation? Oh. Very good. So that's a good insight. Now, yeah. just 
Yeah, also. Okay. Okay. So that's that that that's what I was just about to say. I said it's almost an exact quote from Yeshayahu forty-five verse seven, but it's not an exact quote. Two words here are not in Yeshayahu, and that is es hakol. In the original text, it says. I am God who forms light, creates darkness, makes peace, and creates evil. Yotzer or uvorei choshech, osei shalom, uvorei ra. So that's the answer to your question. Uh, they seem there, there seems to be opposites: light and darkness, peace and everything, peace and evil. Now. Uh, how to organize this. Um, we'll come to the, let's go in order of the text. Okay. Now, the Kabbalists among us would look at this verse, look at this uh, passage, and would see reference to, in the first half of this of uh, the bracha, two of the four spiritual worlds. You remember? Yesira and Bria, right? Yotzer is the world of Yotzira. Bore, the world of Bria. These, frame, these spiritual frameworks, these states of consciousness, these spaces of mind, these attitudes toward the world, are the two middle worlds of the four worlds of consciousness. Yitzira. So if we start from the highest world, Atsilus, which is pre-consciousness, unconsciousness, the world of non-being, then we go to the world of Bria, the world of um, the world of of consciousness, the world of thought, the world of uh, structured analysis, high-minded spirituality. And then we have the world of Yitzira, which is the world of emotion and speech. So which world is higher? Berea is the higher world. Yitzira is the lower world. So in order to answer your question about why we talk about creation, why we talk about the creation of darkness, we'll, we, we ask another question, which is, which is higher, light or darkness? So we always think that light is higher. But in the Kabbalistic worlds indicated here, Darkness is associated with Berea, the higher world. And Yitzira, light, is associated, or is associated with Yitzira, which is the lower world, relatively. So why is darkness in the higher world? Okay. You hear the question, Jane? Yeah. Okay. So, to understand this, we have to understand what the meaning of light and the meaning of darkness is and from whose perspective we're speaking. So here we're speaking from the perspective of the created being. From our perspective, or is that which lends itself to our experience. The higher world is more mysterious to us. And therefore, to us, it appears as darkness. Or uh, to explain this in terms of another, uh, uh, like the human psyche, a berea is associated with the faculty of thought. Thought. thought and yitzira is associated with the faculty of speech. Emotions, but speech. Speech are uniquely connected to the emotions. You notice that when a person 
starts to talk about something that's that they're sad about, they start to cry, right? Because uh, even though they were sad about it before, but the speech, the describing it, the articulating it, uh, wakes up the emotion. So there's a very powerful connection between the emotions and speech. So Yetzirah, the world of emotion, is associated with the faculty of speech. Now, when somebody else is standing in front of you, their thoughts are darkness to you, and their speech is light. You experience them through their speech, but their thoughts are a mystery. But from the perspective of the person themselves, the thoughts are much more tied up with the self, and speech is more tied up with the other, with something with outside of the self. Let's say thoughts are much more authentic to us than speech. And so therefore, Yotzer or Uvore Choshech, we're talking about the, uh, the creative procedure by which this world, as we know it, emerges. And we reflect upon the fact that the greatest spiritual light that a person can experience is still lower than the eternity and the infinity and the mysteriousness of darkness. In um, uh, another way of referring to this is that the or refers to, these are two different lights. The Or and the Choshech are two different lights. Um, the Or, so we talked once upon a time about the uh, internal light, the light that fills the worlds, and the external light, the light that encompasses all the worlds. You remember this? We talked about that, the Makif and the Panimi. The Panimi is the lights that infuse everything, and the makif are the lights that encompass everything. So, um, the light that fills everything is means that we experience it. That it's somehow able to be contained in our consciousness. That fills us. And so therefore we experience it as light. The light that encompasses all worlds is beyond our consciousness. And yet it makes it possible for us to exist at all. It's actually the encompassing light is much more critical to existence than the eternal light, than the internal light. The, the light that fills us, I'm sorry, the light that the external light, the all encompassing light is much more critical to existence than the internal light. The internal light is specific to an individual creation. But that existence could exist at all, that there is such a thing as existence uh, or Maybe that's too broad. Uh, being or um, the context that there is such a thing as context is the surrounding light. And so it's, it's far more necessary, well, not far more necessary, but like much more fundamental to existence is the possibility the context, the all-encompassing light, the, the paper, the necessity of the paper precedes the possibility of writing a book. So when you think of a book, you think of it as words, but actually the paper 
is the unsung hero, the unnoticed aspect of the book. The the white fire upon which the black fire of the Torah is written, right? The, uh, uh, Midrash describes the Torah as originally being written black fire on white fire. And so the, the space around the letters, or actually another way of thinking about it when it comes to speech, every utterance is framed by silence. Right, you know what rhythm is. You think of rhythm as the uh, the uh, rate of of the way a sound repeats itself, but actually rhythm is created by silence in between sounds. Um, so these are some kind of pointers as to how to think about the importance of darkness and why darkness is higher than light in this context. Here we're referring to the creative process. Yotzer or Uvorecho Shech. So I don't want to say your question is does everywhere in the Siddur that it refers to Choshech, is that what we're referring to? I don't know. That's that's uh, that's a big question to ask. I have to think over the whole sitter, right? Okay. So, but th this is the paradox: is that the yotzer is the lower term, and or is the higher term. Because in reality, light yotzer is the lower term, or is the higher term. Bore. Yotzer forms is a lower term, or light is a higher term. Bore is a higher term. Choshech, darkness, is a lower term, right? That's When a human being reads this, that's what strikes us. And so it's meant to introduce us to this idea that the unknown, the mystery, is that which is beyond the grasp of our mind, is far more divine and uh, more closely associated with the everything than, um, than the light is. So we experience it as light, but actually that's, that's only because it's able to be received by our interface. Now we continue. Ose shalom uvore es hakol, who makes peace and creates everything. So let's start with the end. Uvore es hakol, who creates everything. And remember that we said that everything is a euphemism for evil. The Talmud in Baracho says, Instead of evil, it uses the word everything because in the prayers they wanted to use a more uh, pleasant term. That's my translation, Lishnamalia, a more uplifting, a more pleasant term. And however, it's not, it is a euphemism for Ra, for evil. It just isn't, it's not a substitute. It's indicating the same concept. So first, let's take a look at what Ra, what, what evil is. I've thought about this for a long time. What is the definition of evil? So we generally think of evil as malicious intent somebody acting with the intent to do harm to someone else, simply with no positive, with no good intent. 
However, the Torah describes many things as ra, as evil, that don't necessarily uh, that don't necessarily indicate harm or malice. In fact, uh, while in Western culture, uh, something evil is something you do to someone else. But what you do to yourself is your own free choice. In Judaism, however, there are things that are considered ra, even though they don't harm anyone else. And so what it occurs to me, what occurred to me is that there is one term, one description that encompasses all of it, which is ra is selfishness. And truly, when a person acts with malicious intent, often their intent isn't purely to harm the other person. It is the fulfillment of their own impulse or desire disregarding the well-being of the other person. The other person is not important enough for their consideration and therefore they do whatever they want because that's what they want to do. So it, it's some, and sometimes it's because they're angry at that person and therefore they're acting uh, vindictive, they're vengeful or vindictive and angry and therefore they're acting to cause harm to another person. But really what they're trying to do is to address their own feelings of anger, their own feelings of vengefulness, despite the fact that it causes harm to another. And so Ra means selfishness and, uh, and the same, and, and that extends then to even things that a person does to themselves, where uh, when I place myself above my selfish desires, above meaning and ideal. So when I do, when I have disregard for what is right, and instead I do what I want, the Torah would call that Ra. Because that is placing myself above, uh, above what is right, what is meaningful, what is important, and what is godly. And essentially that, that stance of putting what I want over what's right is the same stance that leads a person to commit the most evil that we call in common speech evil. It's that same stance that leads a person to commit what is classically considered evil. But we don't realize that that quality, we don't realize the nature of that stance until it hurts us. But fundamentally, it's that approach. And so, Ra, evil, is selfishness. Yeah? Would you say then that a person who's selfish doesn't even realize the evil that they're creating? Or they may or they may not? They may or may not. Yeah. They may or may not. Right. Well, so so here I'm not talking about harm. I'm saying that when we're talking about Ra, we're not necessarily talking only about harm, but it includes the possibility of harm because there's no consideration. Or to whatever degree the consideration for what is right is missing, greater the greater the possibility there is for actual harm, right? To whatever degree the, the sense of what is right or what is ideally appropriate or what is expected of me by Hashem is missing, the more possibility there is then for me to do actual harm. Or whatever de to whatever degree the desires of myself are primary given the circumstances 
are more likely to be able to do harm, right? So it's, the thought isn't, right? So that a person can be considered rebellious against God. And that's only, again, the self uh, persevering against the knowledge of what is ideally right. But then a person could just be completely self-absorbed and not even considering what's, that there is such a thing as what's right, right? So it's all in the same bucket. So if, if ose shalom, if a bore es hakol means selfishness, and now we understand perhaps why the word kol is here, because the word kol indicates a multitude of many things, all of it, right? You can only have, you can only have coal, everything, if you have many things that you refer to as everything. So everything is a bunch of little selves. And now we understand that shalom, peace, is the antidote because in shalom, I am sublimating myself to the whole. I am part of the whole, not independent. I'm committed to harmony with the other, even though in some way it may undermine my selfishness. So now, um, yeah. I don't know if this is a stretch, but I heard uh, Eli Wiesel once said, if you, if you prefer to be in captivity, then to be an asset. Mm -hmm. Again, the, the peace of mind in his conscience. Um, and that's the, um, and that's why they say the capos lost their souls. Because they, whether or not they did it for food, or they just were forced into it, whatever reason they became a capo, um, they lost their, they lost their souls. Right. Yeah, I think that's uh, a very beautiful, beautiful, uh, very powerful sentiment that Eli Wiesel said, I would rather be uh, a captive than be a prison guard. Uh, even though the prison guard, the Nazi, has more Nazi power, in terms of right? In terms of, in terms of, uh, the Nazi has power, but he has his conscience. Uh, he is connected with everything. He's connected with shalom, even though he's not powerful. And the preservation. Now, I want to take just a maybe reflect on the preservation of self. Right, which we know the preservation of self is important in Torah. So, so how does that fit? So Hillel says, Im ein ani li, ni li. I am not for myself, who is for me? And that perhaps is the answer, that uh, there are two ways to preserve the self. I can preserve the self because I want to be comfortable and I want to feel good. Or I can preserve the self because nobody has a greater obligation for the preservation of this creation of God than the one closest to it. And therefore, nobody can be for me, for this creation of God, the way I can be. Therefore, I have an obligation to be so, to, to be uh, to preserve this creation of God, not because I'm preserving myself, but because I am doing the duty with which I was born, that I was born into. The duty that I was born into is to preserve the self, to preserve this creation of God. And at the same time, if it's all about me, then what am I? Then I'm just a self. Then I have no, I've, I've, ma'ani. I, I am denying the fact that I'm a creation of God if, I, if it's all about me. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, so here we see the, the, the contrast 
or the uh, the uh, parallel. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The uh, Preserve the creation of God by following the Torah. By following the Torah, yes, yes. But also to preserve the tool, preserving the creation of God by following the Torah, but preser preserving this tool, which is ultimately for fulfilling the will of God. And so that then means that I make sure that I eat well and I sleep well and all of that, right? But I'm, I'm not prioritizing my <laughs> eating and sleeping because... Uh, only because of my comfort, I'm doing it because this is the temple uh, that God has given into my trust. If a person commits murder, uh, they're, they're, and this is the difference between murder and killing. Right. Sometimes killing can be saving a life, yeah. your own, or even yeah. Let's say in in a, in a justified war, if there is such a thing. Um, and Rabbi, what was his slander and libel as form of murder? But they again, they all fall, so the, going back to the difference between murder and and killing, is that murder is 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 in order to fulfill one's own impulses, whereas killing is describes the act, but not the meaning behind the act. So a person can sometimes be killing in order to preserve life, killing in order to preserve an important ideal, right? So to the extent that that's permitted or appropriate, again, that it's all about the question of the mean. Is this, is this truly meaningful? And but but in the other case, and that's where, there we go back to slander. It's the same. The, it's it may not look the same from the outside, but it's just a different intensity of that same thing. I want to say what I want to say, just regardless of how it's going to annihilate someone else's well-being. Right. Right. Sometimes you can have lashon hara letoelis by the same token. A person can sometimes say something negative about someone else for uh, for a. a, a a beneficial purpose for justice. for justice or to protect someone or to rebuke someone in order to cause them to improve right? huh? Toelis, yeah so there here's the word so now we can see the symmetry between shalom and ko between shalom and ra because we're not talking about conflict here in the so the opposite of shalom is milchama, let's say. The opposite of peace is war or conflict. But that's not how it's described here. The, the symmetry is described as the difference between peace and evil. So because here we're not talking about uh, what it feels like to be me. We're talking about the grand design of creation. We're characterizing the grand design of creation. And so uh, in the grand design of creation, God's uh, making of everything is for the purpose of the resolution of that everything. Meaning uh, it, the creation of Ra, the creation of evil, isn't uh, a creation of evil per se. God isn't making evil as a thing, but God is creating the capacity for selfishness, that is giving us a self. That self is then the tool that has the discovery and the consciousness and the awareness to seek God to find him and to have a relationship with him. And there we come to the word shalom. So shalom is the purpose for the creation of everything, for, for the creation of separate things that we could, that we could uh, resolve 
that conflict and that we can turn the self into the servant of God. Because of course, without a self, there is no servant of God. There is only God's creation. There's no worship without self. You have a question. Is that difficult for a Jew? Worship? Yeah. I, I, I think I'm, um, you want to say something? Yeah, please do. I can't fathom God creating evil. I have trouble with that. Right. And so that element of choice, okay, which is internally in humans, lies there lies the creation of of course not with god so you have a problem with god creating evil it's unfathomable and instead you refer you prefer to think about it as the choice of people that creates evil and yet at the same time what we're saying here is and this is kind of the the uh perhaps the argument being put forward here by trans by substituting or uh, uh, replacing the word evil with everything which is to say it isn't that god creates evil but that god creates a self which is by the way uh, a uniquely divine uh, product is consciousness that a person can be self-conscious that is the neshama the self that can be conscious so the the uh the nef- the ruach is the consciousness of the self the neshama is the self that is conscious so this is This is a remarkable phenomenon that an individual uh, piece of the vast cosmic organism that is this whole universe, that is really one, this whole universe is really one massive organism that's operating in harmony with itself, reflecting divine Uh, a divine coherence and unity in all of it. So it's truly remarkable that one part of that one small blip, a molecule in this universe would have the experience of a self because really the only true experience of a self would be the mind of the universe itself. Like that's the only thing that really exists is the whole universe. So it's truly divine to refer to that an individual creature, that an indi- not an individual creature, but that, a, that one, uh, one um, particle in this whole organism has that experience of self. At the same time, because it isn't true, because we aren't truly a self, we have this experience of being an individual, but that gives rise to the possibility of selfishness. At the same time, the other thing that it gives rise to is it gives rise to the possibility of the experience of the harmony in the universe. And it gives rise to the experience of being able to worship the divine truth, to be able to worship God, to have a relationship with God, right? A relationship is only possible between two selves. So, but at the same time, there is an unfortunate, there is a necessary consequence. It's impossible to have a self without self without the potential for selfishness so did god create evil 
in a way, kind of, yeah. But actually, it's the self. It's that it's ultimately the self that does the evil. And at the same time, the self is a profoundly divine idea. Because the only true self that exists is the whole universe. So you don't believe in the only teachers that don't program like the animals. So if you put a program and you act a certain way with impulses or with, with yeah. reflexes. Yeah, you're just a, a you're just a, the, an animal is is operating on instinct. Yeah, instinct and, and impulses and whatever. Right, and those and are those are organic. Just like everything in the universe has its own pattern. So is that how angels function? Yeah. Ah, so we're like special. Yes, we're more special than the angels. Yeah. And, and that's, so I want you to hold on to that thought because we're going to get into that, to the angels. We're going to be talking about angels coming up. That's part of the next, uh, the subject matter that follows. Um, so why talk about angels if we're higher than angels? Okay, so that's uh, that's for another time. Yeah, okay. So the Torah was given to us, not to the angels. Correct. The Torah was given to us and not to the angels, because we are embodying that divine choice, that divine self. It's the, the Torah is divine, and therefore it belongs with a divine being like a human being. So the Torah has above everything else it has 613 ways for us to get close attention so i i would that's a classic that's a classic hasidic thing of saying that the torah represents 613 ways for us to connect with be connected with god i would just take and it in a don't need it because they already have that one instant. they're already connected with god right uh, i i i'm i would lately i've been thinking about it in a slightly different way which is that the, the Torah is directing us toward what is organic behavior. To that this, the, the same way animals behave instinctively and do what they're supposed to do. We, however, don't behave instinctively and do what we're supposed to do. And so we have the potential to be out of sync with the universe, out of harmony with the universe. And so instead, we're given it as a mitzvah. We're given it as a commandment which is that we would intentionally be in harmony with the universe. But fundamentally, what we're doing is we're be, it's organic behavior. It's natural behavior, right? The, the, the behaviors described or indicated by the Torah are organic. They're natural. They are what a member of the universe, a particular member of the universe is intended to be doing. And in this way, yes, we're connected with God, meaning we're in harmony with the wholeness of the universe. They're out of sync with the universe and therefore they're disconnected from God, right? But isn't everybody at times not connected? I mean, yes. Perfect. Yes. Nobody is perfect. That's true. And plants get sick. Plants get sick. Plants get sick. Plants are sometimes not in, but that's part of the plan. It's part of the that's part of the way the universe operates. So this is what we're the the this is an important introduction just in our last five minutes here. This is an important introduction to what we're going to be saying in the Shema, Hashem Echad, God is one. So we're identifying these different parts of this whole universe and recognizing that it's all one light is of course the first thing we experience. We're talking about spiritual inspiration. That's great. But recognize that darkness is mystery. That's also part of this. And in a sense, it's even more, it's even more fundamental. It creates the context for the potential of light, for the possibility of experience. And the same goes for evil or selfishness is also part of this oneness because it gives rise to the possibility of shalom, of intentional harmony. There is one interpretation that says everything was contained in the darkness and had to be taken out. Uh, I, I haven't heard that, but they form black. Yeah, that's because you pile them on top of each other. But 
uh, that's because they contradict each other. They, when you when you get true harmony with the colors, you get light, right? Uh, you get clear light. But uh, th that everything is everything is originally contained in darkness. I would say that darkness is the darkness is one one way of looking at the darkness at the makif is that it is the infinite possibility, the infinite potential. Infinite potential is not necessarily, is not a thing, right? It's not an identifiable thing. There's no light there. So, uh, but everything is contained in the infinite potential of our source. And so, uh, when it emerges as a specific thing, then it's light. It's uh, comprehensible. It's uh, intelligible. Yeah, Jane? Well, what you say is that if you view darkness that way, you can really be burned. Because if you, if you view, I mean, if you see every the kindness, the soul in every direct that you go to, you know, that person okay. will really. No okay. matter how good you are to them, they'll dump on you. So what are what is it? What is it that you would say? So your question is, this is risky. This it seems kind of naive, and can lead a person to be harmed right. by not recognizing. Right. Right. So so what is the perspective on evil that we're talking about here? How would you describe the perspective on evil? I understand the consequence, but what is this perspective that has this consequence? Selfishness, the selfishness, and the um, thoughtlessness. Yeah. Even whether or not they meet the harm, that that's the ultimate. Um, that's the ultimate result. Yeah. So I don't see any naivete here. Um, I, I'm not saying that it's okay to be selfish. No, I'm saying the opposite. Right. I'm just the opposite. What are you saying? I'm saying that if you're, if you're. Pollyanna, you get hurt. Right. So, so this, this. You know, Pollyanna, the story. Pollyanna. Yeah, somebody who puts rose-colored glasses on, right, and thinks that everyone is good. Right. So we're we're being very clear that evil exists, and and it and we're pointing out, however, where it emerges, and why it's here. Evil exists because it emerges from the self and the self is here because God wants it to be here. But our job is as humans, the keepers of the self, the ones who are each responsible for our own self and the ones who encounter other selves, our job is to continually bring the self towards shalom, towards worship, towards good intention because good intention also comes from the self and to sublimate and to move away from selfishness. And so we can definitely uh, identify in ourselves when we're being selfish and when we're being purpose and meaningfully directed, when we're being directed towards harmony with the universe, with Shalom. And we can potentially also identify behaviors that are in others that are also selfish and therefore evil. And to avoid and and, and as a matter of fact, we become more sensitive, right? I think people who, there are many people who might consider themselves, you know, not naive. I don't know what the opposite of naive is, probably not a good word, not the right word I would want to say. But there, I'm sure there are people who consider themselves realistic and not naive, who would not be aware of how dangerous certain behaviors are, certain behavior patterns are. They would say that's harmless. But a person who davens would say, that's not harmless at all. That is the very ingredient that creates murder. That's the very ingredient that creates theft and rape. Then there's no rehabilitation of anybody. There is rehabilitation of, well, there's the re, there's, there isn't necessarily, you can't take back a sin, but you can rehabilitate the self. Selfishness. But not every act of 
That's true, but it's the same. That stance is an evil stance. That's you've you, you've opened up uh, a dangerous place. You've opened up an evil place and when a person acts justice. selfishly. What's that? You're saying that there has to be justice. What you're saying. Okay. We'll leave it on that happy note.